Altruism in this sense is different from the philosophical concept of altruism, in which an action would only be called altruistic if it was done with the conscious intention of helping another. In the behavioral sense, there is no such requirement. As such, it is not evaluated in moral terms, it is the consequences of an action for reproductive fitness that determine whether the action is considered altruistic, not the intentions, if any, with which the action is performed. The term altruism was coined by the French philosopher Auguste Comte in French as altruisme for an antonym of egoism. He derived it from an Italian altrua, which in turn was derived from Latin alteri, meaning other people or somebody else. Altruistic behaviors appear most obviously in kin relationships, such as in parenting, but may also be evident among wider social groups, such as in social insects. They allow an individual to increase the success of its genes by helping relatives that share those genes. Obligate altruism is the permanent loss of direct fitness. For example, honeybee workers may forage for the colony. Facultative altruism is temporary loss of direct fitness example. Florida scrub jay helping at the nest, then gaining parental territory. Overview. In the science of ethology, and more generally in the study of social evolution, on occasion, some animals do behave in ways that reduce their individual fitness but increase the fitness of other individuals in the population. This is a Functional definition of altruism. Research in evolutionary theory has been applied to social behavior, including altruism. Cases of animals helping individuals to whom they are closely related can be explained by kin selection, and do not consider true altruism. Beyond the physical exertions that in some species mothers and in some species fathers undertake to protect their young, extreme examples of sacrifice may occur. One example is metrophagy in the spider Stegodiphus. Another example is a male spider allowing a female fertilized by him to eat him. Hamilton's rule describes the benefit of such altruism in terms of rights coefficient of relationship to the beneficiary and the benefit granted to the beneficiary minus the cost to the sacrificer. Should this sum be greater than zero a fitness gain will result from the sacrifice. When apparent altruism is not between kin, it may be based on reciprocity. A monkey will present its back to another monkey, who will pick out parasites, after a time the roles will be reversed. Such reciprocity will pay off, in evolutionary terms, as long as the costs of helping are less than the benefits of being helped and as long as animals will not gain in the long run by cheating, that is to say, by receiving favors without returning them. This is elaborated on in evolutionary game theory and specifically the prisoner's dilemma as social theory. Altruism is an evolutionary enigma, not because it cannot arise by mutation, but because it is evolutionarily unstable. It is even possible for altruism to spread to all the members of a population through a variety of mechanisms. However, should a mutation for selfishness arise, the carriers of that altered gene will almost always be fitter than the rest of the population, resulting, ultimately, in the replacement of altruism by selfishness. This is the conundrum that has exercised biologists since Darwin initially recognized the problem. Implications in evolutionary theory The existence of altruism in nature is at first sight puzzling because altruistic behavior reduces the likelihood that an individual will reproduce. The idea that group selection might explain the evolution of altruism was first broached by Darwin himself in The Descent of Man, and selection in relation to sex. The concept of group selection has had a checkered and controversial history in evolutionary biology but the uncritical good of the species tradition came to an abrupt halt in the 1960s, due largely to the work of George C. Williams and John Maynard Smith as well as Richard Dawkins. These evolutionary theorists pointed out that natural selection acts on the individual, and that it is the individual's fitness that drives evolution. 
A group advantage that is disadvantageous to the individual cannot evolve, because the selfish individual will leave, on average, more offspring than those who join the pack and suffer injuries as a result. If the selfishness is hereditary, this will ultimately result in the population consisting entirely of selfish individuals. However, in the 1960s and 1970s an alternative to the group selection theory emerged. This was the kin selection theory, due originally to W. D. Hamilton. Kin selection is an instance of inclusive fitness, which is based on the notion that an individual shares only half its genes with each offspring, but also with each full sib. From an evolutionary genetic point of view it is therefore as advantageous to help with the upbringing of full sibs as it is to produce and raise one's own offspring. The two activities are evolutionarily entirely equivalent. Cooperative breeding could thus evolve without the need for group-level selection. This quickly gained prominence among biologists interested in the evolution of social behavior. In 1971 Robert Trivers introduced his reciprocal altruism theory to explain the evolution of helping at the nest of an unrelated breeding pair of birds. He argued that an individual might act as a helper if there was a high probabilistic expectation of being helped by the recipients at some later date. If, however, the recipients did not reciprocate when it was possible to do so, the altruistic interaction with these recipients would be permanently terminated. But if the recipients did not cheat then the reciprocal altruism would continue indefinitely to both parties' advantage. This model was considered by many to be evolutionarily unstable because it is prone to invasion by cheats for the same reason that cooperative hunting can be invaded and replaced by cheats. However, Trivers did make reference to the Prisoner's Dilemma game which, ten years later, would restore interest in Trivers' reciprocal altruism theory, but under the title of Tit for Tat. In its original form the Prisoner's Dilemma game described two awaiting trial prisoners, A and B, each faced with the choice of betraying the other or remaining silent. The game has four possible outcomes. They both betray each other, and are both sentenced to two years in prison. A betrays B, which sets A free and B is sentenced to four years in prison. B betrays A, with the same result as except that it is B who is set free and the other spends four years in jail. Both remain silent, resulting in a six-month sentence each. Clearly is the best mutual strategy, but from the point of view of the individual betrayal is unbeatable. Remaining silent results in a four-year or six-month sentence. This is exemplified by a further example of the PDG. Two strangers attend a restaurant together and decide to split the bill. The mutually best ploy would be for both parties to order the cheapest items on the menu. But if one member of the party exploits the situation by ordering the most expensive items, then it is best for the other member to do likewise. In fact, if the fellow diner's personality is completely unknown, and the two diners are unlikely ever to meet again, it is always in one's own best interest to eat as expensively as possible. Situations in nature that are subject to the same dynamics as the PDG define cooperative behavior. It is never in the individual's fitness interests to cooperate. Even though mutual cooperation rewards the two contestants more highly than any other strategy, cooperation cannot evolve under these circumstances. However, in 1981 Axel Rod and Hamilton noted that if the same contestants in the PDG meet repeatedly then tit for tat is a robust strategy which promotes altruism. In tit for tat both players opening moves a cooperation. Thereafter each contestant repeats the other player's last move, resulting in a seemingly endless sequence of mutually cooperative moves. However, mistakes severely undermine tit-for-tat's effectiveness, giving rise to prolonged sequences of betrayal, which can only be rectified by another mistake. Since these initial discoveries, all the other possible IPD game strategies have been identified. But all can be outperformed by at least one of the other strategies, should one of the players switch to such a strategy. 
The result is that none is evolutionarily stable, and any prolonged series of the iterated prisoner's dilemma game, in which alternative strategies arise at random, gives rise to a chaotic sequence of strategy changes that never ends. In the light of the iterated prisoner's dilemma game failing to provide a full answer to the evolution of cooperation or altruism, several alternative explanations have been proposed. There are striking parallels between altruistic acts and exaggerated sexual ornaments displayed by some animals, particularly certain bird species, such as, amongst others, the peacock. Both are costly in fitness terms, and both are generally conspicuous to other members of the population or species. This led Amot Zahavi to suggest that both might be fitness signals rendered evolutionarily stable by his handicap principle. If a signal is to remain reliable, and generally resistant to falsification, the signal has to be evolutionarily costly. Thus, if a liar were to use the highly costly signal, which seriously eroded its real fitness, it would find it difficult to maintain a semblance or normality. Zahavi borrowed the term, handicap principle, from sports handicapping systems. These systems are aimed at reducing disparities in performance, thereby making the outcome of contests less predictable. In a horse handicap race, provenly faster horses are given heavier weights to carry under their saddles than inherently slower horses. Similarly, in amateur golf, better golfers have fewer strokes subtracted from their raw scores than the less talented players. The handicap therefore correlates with unhandicapped performance, making it possible, if one knows nothing about the horses, to predict which unhandicapped horse would win an open race. It would be the one handicapped with the greatest weight in the saddle. The handicaps in nature are highly visible, and therefore a peahen, for instance, would be able to deduce the health of a potential mate by comparing its handicap with those of the other males. The loss of the male's fitness caused by the handicap is offset by its increased access to females, which is as much of a fitness concern as is its health. An altruistic act is, by definition, similarly costly. It would therefore also signal fitness, and is probably as attractive to females as a physical handicap. If this is the case altruism is evolutionarily stabilized by sexual selection. There is an alternate strategy for identifying fit mates which does not rely on one gender having exaggerated sexual ornaments or other handicaps, but is generally applicable to most, if not all sexual creatures. This is because that altered appearance and functionality will be unusual, peculiar, and different from the norm within that population. The norm against which these unusual features are judged is made up of fit attributes that have attained their plurality through natural selection, while less adaptive attributes will be in the minority or frankly rare. Since the overwhelming majority of mutant features are maladaptive, and it is impossible to predict evolution's future direction, sexual creatures would be expected to prefer mates with the least number of unusual or minority features. This will have the effect of a sexual population rapidly shedding peripheral phenotypic features and canalizing the entire outward appearance and behavior so that all the members of that population will begin to look remarkably similar in every detail, as illustrated in the accompanying photograph of the African pygmy kingfisher, Ispadina picta. Once a population has become as homogeneous in appearance as is typical of most species, its entire repertoire of behaviors will also be rendered evolutionarily stable, including any altruistic, cooperative and social characteristics. Thus, in the example of the selfish individual who hangs back from the rest of the hunting pack but who nevertheless joins in the spoils, that individual will be recognized as being different from the norm, and will therefore find it difficult to attract a mate. Its genes will therefore have only a very small probability of being passed on to the next generation, thus evolutionarily stabilizing cooperation and social interactions at whatever level of complexity is the norm in that population. Reciprocity Mechanisms Altruism in animals describes a range of behaviors performed by animals that may be to their own disadvantage but which benefit others. 
the costs and benefits are measured in terms of reproductive fitness, or expected number of offspring. So by behaving altruistically, an organism reduces the number of offspring it is likely to produce itself, but boosts the likelihood that other organisms are to produce offspring. There are other forms of altruism in nature other than risk-taking behavior, such as reciprocal altruism. This biological notion of altruism is not identical to the everyday human concept. For humans, an action would only be called altruistic if it was done with the conscious intention of helping another. Yet in the biological sense there is no such requirement. Instead, until we can communicate directly with other species, an accurate theory to describe altruistic acts between species is biological market theory. Humans and other animals exchange benefits in several ways, known technically as reciprocity mechanism. No matter what the mechanism, the common thread is that benefits find their way back to the original giver. Symmetry-based also known as the buddy system. Mutual affection between two parties prompts similar behavior in both directions without need to track of daily give and take, so long as the overall relationship remains satisfactory. This is one of the most common mechanism of reciprocity in nature. This kind is present in humans, primates, and many other mammals. Attitudinal also known as, if you're nice, I'll be nice too. This mechanism of reciprocity is similar to the heuristic of the golden rule. Treat others how you would like to be treated. Parties mirror one another's attitudes, exchanging favors on the spot. Instant attitudinal reciprocity occurs among monkeys, and people often rely on it with strangers and acquaintances. Calculated also known as what have you done for me lately, individuals keep track of the benefits they exchange with particular partners, which helps them decide to whom to return favors. This mechanism is typical of chimpanzees and very common among human relationships. Yet some opposing experimental research suggests that calculated or contingent reciprocity does not spontaneously arise in laboratory experimental settings, despite patterns of behavior.